Greetings, everyone. I have a question for you. If Jesus walked the earth today, what would he say about the church and what's going on in the world today? What would he think about all the things that are going on in our churches? What, what would he actually think? Well, today we're going to explore these and more as we delve into the book of Revelations, chapter 2, on the Christian Marauder, the things that are. Last week we explored Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 where Jesus tells John to write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. And we also saw in Revelation chapter 1 that Jesus was standing in the midst of seven candlesticks or seven menorahs. Do you remember that? Jesus was standing in the middle and there are seven menorahs around him in a circle. And so he was there examining them. And we also remember that a menorah has seven candlesticks that branch out from it. So, so Jesus was looking at 49 individual bits of flame. Okay, And in Revelation chapter 1 verse 20, Jesus goes on and says, And the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the messengers, are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So these seven menorahs with their, each of them had seven flames on them for a total of 49 flames. Jesus was standing in the midst of these seven menorahs. What, what Jesus is doing is in examining the seven churches and the light that they are producing. Each of the menorahs had seven candle flames on them. And if you add up all those again, it equals 49. So what Jesus was doing was examining the seven churches to see if they were getting ready for the time of the end. Why? Because one of the meanings, one of the sub-meanings for the definition of the, of the number 49 means the time of the end, just before the Jubilee began. According to the Torah, the Jubilee began in the 49th and 50th year. It brings a lot of confusion. But basically, the 49th year was the time that people prepared for and get everything together so they can rest on that 50th year Jubilee. They, in other words, they got all the supplies, everything together. They prepared for it. So what Jesus was seeing the churches at the time of the end, he was looking at that. Now next, Jesus was standing with seven golden candlesticks, okay, with the seven menorahs, and, and the seven has a meaning too. In the ancient Hebrew pictograph, it's a picture of a plow, and most people try to simplify the meaning perfection. Well, it means perfection, but how we interpret perfection is, is way off. But um, it means perfection in the Old Testament times, mean wholeness, soundness, and... Uh, uh, maturity, okay, just, you know, you're, you're growing in that. So the idea of the plow was to grow forth perfection, how, you know, getting to a state of maturity in the body of Christ. So what we see in Revelation chapter 1 verse 20, we see Jesus examining if the churches were plowing into the perfection, wholeness, and soundness and bringing the people into maturity, actually shining forth the gifts revealed by the seven spirits of God. Mentioned in verse 4, describing the attributes that are found in Isaiah chapter 11 too. Remember we talked about the seven spirits of God. The Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of might and so forth. Remember, so the Lord is looking at each one of those menorahs with their seven flames. And those seven flames on the menorah represent the seven spirits of God. Who are, and see, they were examining if the ministers and the churches, these seven churches, were producing the attributes of the Holy Spirit. What were they teaching? He was an examining that. He was looking at those things. Just like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, so let your light shine before men. Don't hide it under a basket. So he was checking to see if the churches were uh, being guided by the Holy Spirit in order to bring and plow through to Christian maturity. That's what Jesus was looking at. A lot of people miss this when they study the book of Revelation because they don't bother to look through signs and symbols. They don't bother looking how it connects uh, what was called the gibbons of the day. And gibbons of the day is what the common people of that time period where the book was written would understand. We need to go back and kind of look through their eyes too, which is what I am doing here, trying to help you. So what Jesus is doing was he is examining if the church is going to be producing the, the light of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's doing. 
at the time of the end before the great jubilee happens when christ comes to reign on earth that's what he's doing jesus standing in the midst of the church is getting ready to give a prognosis because he sees some problems there about the light they are producing all in chapters two and three which we are going to be studying today in the book of revelation so jesus was examining the state of the end time church as described as the things that are because jesus is describing the things that are now the things that are, have been seen as chapter one chapter two concerning the things that are at the time of the end you got to understand that the language of bible prophecy and the language of the lord has layers of meaning in his text and it's not so linear and westerner like we think where we follow a template we check off the box and say we got it we understand it we move on and you don't know anything you forget the layers of depths in here because of double meanings and a lot of things triple meanings depths of meanings in the text so Jesus is looking at the things that are concerning the end time church. Why that is, we will explore shortly here. While Revelations chapter 2 and 3 are about the final state of the end time church, grouped into seven different types of people who flock together from one extreme to another. You have this Ephesus type of person, you have the Sardis type of person, you have the Pergamum type of person, you have the Thyatira type of person, and they all flock together, okay, in these groups of people from one extreme from militant to soft militant or, or, or moderate or, or, or lackadaisical type of believers in each one of these churches. So Jesus is ex examining people in the church and what the churches are producing, if they're producing the light of the Holy Spirit or not. Yeah, and I gotta tell you, it's true. These are dispensations in, of church history, but they also point to the condition of the end time church. With that, turn to Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Remember, folks, when you study Bible prophecy, especially book of Revelation, everything is important, like the meaning of the name of Ephesus, uh, the history of what happened there in the church, early church days. Everything is important. Also, knowing the givens of that society and time and those people are very important because they lived in an era where they worshiped pagan deities. As the Bible says, they sacrifice unto demons or demonic realm and not unto uh, idols. And so who they are worshiping and why they are worshiping and how the, the church fought against that in spiritual warfare. We have to encounter all that into his understand and unlock the layers of meaning of what is being said in this verse they were you know worshiping fallen angels is what they were doing so we need to look at all these factors when studying bible prophecy so let's look at the meaning of ephesus revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 7. ephesus means desirable or desiring or what is desirable what is permitted Okay, in Acts chapter 19, verse 27 and 35, we find that Ephesus had a patron god called Diana, the Roman god, goddess Diana. Diana goes by other names such as Ishtar and Azara, just like I said. And it's just an attribute, a finger puppet of Ishtar, who was once male, who now became female. You got to understand these deities and what they do. Diana was known to the Greeks as Artemis, the huntress, okay? The goddess of the hunt, a warrior, a tamer of animals, the seducer of men's conscience, and had a lots of lower rank entities to do her bidding, okay? The Romans blended Diana with two other entities, and so therefore you have Diana Triformis, who was the goddess of three characteristics, the hunt, the moon, and the underworld. So Diana was the patron goddess of the hunter and protector of virgins and tamed in area so other characteristics of Ishtar shine through, like building of commerce, a sex trade, and war, and, and envy and strife. I won't get into all that. The etymology of the name Diana means to shine, to give light. Isn't that interesting? You know, uh, Ishtar. The Queen of Heaven, or Ishtar, just think about the light, the lower and lesser lights, and I won't get into all that. But the name Diana means to shine, to give off light. Thus, the occultic rites and rituals were in her arsenal to hunt the souls of men and women, to entrap them. The worship of Diana was big business in the first century. The worship of Diana morphed into uh, worshiping of two other goddesses, the old crone and the mother. And they became blended into the triple goddess, like I tried to say earlier. That's important. With that, in that form of worship, transgenderism was big. 
and sexual exploitation of preteen children was the norm. In fact, a preteen girl would have to go up to the temple area and sit there and, and, and wait for the first guy came along to have sex with. I mean, these, these, this was a very perverted and gross and abusive of children as you can possibly get religion. Very sexually exploited. Ew. That's the Aphrodite finger puppet. I won't get into all that. But that's the triple goddess worship brought in uh, things like the males would self-castrate themselves, become women, and women would mutilate themselves and look like men. And so the high priestess and priestess were usually transgender. So transgenderism and androgyny was really big. Now, people ask, why would they do that? Why would androgyny be, be so big? Well, if you do the research and if you look at uh, H.P. Blavatsky's work, Secret Doctrine, she answers that question because the ancient pagan world thought the, the best form of state of godhood one could reach is androgyny because the old gods were androgynous. Ishtar was once male, became female, so forth, etc. So they looked up and aspired to act and be just like the storylines of their pagan gods. See, the storylines of the ancient pagan gods taught humanity sin and depravity. They're not their actual storylines. That's what they taught people. These people, these entities were viewed like the superheroes of their day. And so people would want to be like a Diana. They want to be like that. And so they act out the storylines of intrigue, backstabbing, lying, and betrayal. These ancient pagan deities weren't doing that to themselves because they're walking lockstep with Satan to destroy humanity and entrap God to act contradictory toward himself so they can overthrow God and put him down. And so they, they can exalt Satan's throne with all these fallen watchers in charge of everything and God no longer being in charge. That's their plan, okay? I'm just saying. So the males would self-castrate themselves and they would try to be androgynous to be more like their deities. We're seeing that today, aren't we? So, so Diana was one of the leading principalities mentioned in Ephesians 6.12. There are principalities and powers in the heavenly places, right? Occultists say that uh, Diana or Ishtar is Satan's favorite daughter who commands 40 legions. I find that Diana commands a lot of little entities called nymphs, okay? And they seek to seduce a network of people to work through. That's what they do. Their, the basic role of he, she played was to enforce what is desirable and permitted by Satan in the world. And Ephesus means what? Desirable and permissible. So Di Diana does so by teaching beauty and redefining love that controls and seeks to dominate and war against those who oppose and to hunt the souls of men and bring them into this fold. It was a very popular religion because it was so uh, depraved. Okay. Without knowing a few facts like that about Ephesus, folks will miss a lot being said in chapter 2. The people back then understood these things, like I said earlier, as givens, and we do not. We do not understand the givens of the society that they lived in. And let's look at chapter 2, verse 1 of Revelations. And to the angel of the church of Ephesus, what is desirable and permittable? What's desirable? Or you can say, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, what is desirable? Right. These things says he who holds the seven stars, that means the messengers, the angels, in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. He's examining the seven menorahs. Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And have found them liars, and yet persevered and have, have patience, have labored for my name's sake, have not become weary. Okay? So the Lord was looking at their works, the light that they were shining. Were they really producing the attributes of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, they had works, they had labor, they had patience, they had some of these attributes of the Holy Spirit. They tested who say they're apostles and are not, and they found them liar, and they let everybody know about it. They have persevered, they have patience, they've labored for the Lord's sake, and they have not become weary. So this is good traits here. So the Lord's looking at the light they are producing. And, the, you know, what are they producing? Are they plowing toward perfection and maturity, making people whole and sound in Jesus Christ, mature in Jesus Christ? Is that what they're doing? So he's looking at that, and he's seeing these things there. 
Okay, so he's looking at the condition of the end time church of the of the Ephesus type of people who are grouped together in churches like this. Birds of a feather do flock together, folks. Just keep tracking with me. So far, so good. But verse 4 says this. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. And I just want to let you know that I'm reading from the New King James Version, okay? Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. So what type of people congregate together that are called the Ephesus people? Let's examine that. These people, uh, they work in labor with patient endurance and they cannot bear those who are evil. The short answer is they like to control and judge by what they see and launch into browbeating and they also like to cut themselves off from the rest of the body of Christ as being the only right ones in the church, the only desirable ones in the church, the only ones that are permitted to teach or have any say in the church. They were the leaders of the church. They are the big shots of the church. They are the determiners of what is desirable and permitted in the church. See how the name of Ephesus, who means desirable and permitted, fits in this? Okay, keep tracking with me. They relish to test those who say they are apostles and are not and prove them liars. They do that. They're excellent heretic hunters. I bet you you know some folks. But these folks are sticklers for legalism. They persevere. They have patience. They labor for Jesus' namesake and do not grow weary. They know the word of God and doctrine backwards and forwards because only they know what is desirable and permitted in the church. Okay, keep tracking with me. Got to keep the name of Ephesus when you talk about the Ephesus type of people. They are the ones who determine what is desirable and permitted in the church. And nevertheless, as verse 4 says, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now that phrase Remove your lampstand from its place has several meanings and connotations to it. The first, that most people kind of overlook, but I heard some commentaries throughout my uh, Christian experience and, and read some too, that that means Ephesus thought they were the arbiters, the sole arbiters of what is desirable and permissible. They were the first ones. They were the premier ones. So that what that meant was that they will remove that candlestick and place it at the end of the line of the church. So they become the seventh church. <laughs> and so another church would step up in its place. Okay? That's one interpretation removed from its place. Another interpretation, which is more widely accepted, is that, hey, those of you who do not repent, bye. Adios, amigos. You're out of here. No more. Adios. In other words, you're removed from its place. You're no longer desirable, permissible. You're going to the ash heap, okay, to be burned. I'm just saying mildly if you don't repent, okay. So those are the two meanings of uh, removing the lampstand from its place unless they repent. That's a serious charge. Why? Because they love their heretic hunting, their works and their labor. They love their cold facts about doctrine more than they love God. In other words, they left their love for God that they had in the beginning where they're serving God with a pure heart and pure motives because they're doing it for the love of God. They understood things. They, they judged by grace and mercy, but no longer. Now they judge by what is desirable and permissible. Do you get the picture? So their first love for God, they had that zeal had been replaced for cold legalistic nitpicking and browbeating. They decide what makes the church beautiful what makes it right and wrong if you don't comply well they bash the innocent along with the guilty to prove they love god and are the only desirable ones that are permitted to do these things you know anybody like that by chance one of the hallmarks of the triple goddess worship of diana is to determine what is makes beautiful and to maintain control and also to dictate what the standards are in society it's a real jezebel spirit going on here more on that later artemis is basically taking control of the church artemis was kicked out of there the, the diana the triple goddess was defeated by the early church of ephesus but it came it came back and began a counterattack. and now instead of artemis 
say, you know, uh, what was desirable and permitted, the church was going to do it. So Artemis slipped back in the church masquerading, I guess, and uh, influencing the people of Ephesus to dominate what is desirable and permissible in the church and to hunt souls. And see, the Ephesus people hunted heretics. <laughs> just got to, you know, you know, just look at things for a second. Just look at the, these things. So what I see here is the Diana Artemis Ishtar is back controlling the church with illusions of being the, the dominant, desirable ones. Their pride is full-blown, all justified by what they do to prove that they love God, not even realizing they come under the spell of a fallen watcher who was kicked out of Ephesus way off in the beginning. It's because they like to control the entire church and tell the church what is desirable and permissible, just like the meaning of the name Ephesus means. They were the ones who were going to be the arbiters of that alone. Do you, do you know any people like that? But as Revelation chapter 2, 6 says, they have a redeeming quality. But this you have, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So let me explain what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans are, or who the Nicolaitans were, and there are several um, interpretations. So I'll, I'll kind of work through like one or two of these so you get an idea. It comes from a heretic called uh, Nicholas, who came in and brought in sort of the, what do you call it, the, the sexual component of sexual immorality into the church to be practiced in order to reach a higher state of being. In other words, if you think of, um, the best way I can put it, if you, some people may not know who Rasputin is, but Rasputin had this doctrine where in order to experience God's grace, you have to go into all kinds of debauchery and sin and so, okay? So Nicholas kind of is the founder of that mentality. And so he, if you look, re research it just real quickly and sum up real quickly, it was okay to, to marry uh, your mother or your mother could marry your kids or you can have incest or you can do whatever sexually perverted thing you want in order to experience God's grace. That's basically. So the second thing that the Nicolaitans did was to set up a hierarchy of leadership of bosses, of elites in the church who dictate what is desirable and permissible. You have a hierarchy of super apostles, prophets, and uh, leaders in the church, and uh, all this stuff. And only they have the arbit arbiters of truth, and they will tell you what the Bible means. And so that was the idea of the Nicolaitans, and God says he hates that. The one redeeming feature of the church of Ephesus they had is they hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. So that's what they did. They left that first love. They would come in and they loved God. It was balanced by grace and mercy to determine what is desirable and permissible. But then all of a sudden they just loved their heretic hunting, their fighting, their infighting, and all this stuff, and being right at all costs more than their love for God as their arbiter of what makes desirable and permissible in God's sight. And thus, they fell away. I mean, that's, I hope you get the picture of that. Look at this. So the Lord wants these folks to return to their first love that drew such folks to be saved. So the Lord is just trying to tell people like that, return to your first love, balance with grace and judgment and mercy and humility and so forth, etc. A balance with what the light of the Holy Spirit is producing, the seven attributes. And you have some wisdom. Have some understanding. Have a little compassion. Look at things like you once did when you first got saved. God gave you great grace and mercy when he saved you. Why can't you show that to other people? Yeah, there are Nicolaitans out there and you do great things. And you do wonderful, wonderful things and heretic hunting. But you also slaughter the innocent along with the guilty. Okay? Just remember that. Let's listen to what Revelation chapter 2, 7 says. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I'll give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Folks, I know you know people like this. They are in every church, every denomination, every non-denomination, and they have a tendency to flock together in places of like mind. Remember, one of the hallmarks of the end-time church is called the great apostasy, the great falling away. And the church of Ephesus was falling away 
from their first love. Folks, don't fall into that mess. They love their legalistic, formalistic nitpicking, their heresy hunting, and think themselves as the only authority to decide what is right in the church. This actually caused a chain reaction and began dividing the church and creates rebellion. People just rebel against these type of people and it invites that rebellion on down the line throughout the church. An apostasy sets in. Folks, let's return to our first love, right? So let's look at Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 and 11. The church at Smyrna, or some people say Smyrna. I, I, I'll say Smyrna. Okay? This is known as the persecuted church, and most commentaries, you know, I'm just pretty much stick with the commentaries here, it's known as the persecuted church. The name of Smyrna means a place of myrrh. Myrrh was used in uh, an ingredient for death and burial, had a lot of death and burial associated with it. was also used in oils and healing salve as well, okay, and also a place of healing. And myrrh was also used as a synonym or a description of joy. So that's what the name of Smyrna means. So let's look and see how that applies into what the Lord is speaking to the church in Smyrna. So into the church of Smyrna, right, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8, And to the angel of the, of the church of Smyrna, right, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. And immediately, we have the meaning of, of Smyrna refined, of myrrh, referring to uh, resurrection, life and death. Okay, Remember, Jesus had uh, precious aloes and, and myrrh and stuff and spices in his tomb placed, and then he rose from the dead. This is what it's talking about. This is the first, He's the first and the last. He is the Lord God Almighty, who came in human flesh. The second person of the, of the Trinity. I can't, I'm can't. i not going to go into the doctrine of the Trinity now. It's not three gods. It's one God and one essence. I won't get into all that. Um, I tried to share that in part one of this series. So go back and look at that. These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Very important because a lot of people miss this. Here Jesus is mocking a fallen watcher who thinks their rising out of the earth will defeat him. How do I know this? got to keep tracking with me the patron deity of that era is kybele and that was the and morphed into the one of the main patrons of the triple goddess worship who was responsible for the well-being of smyrna who would provide fertility health and food and it was us and kybele was a very jealous avenger for protection protecting what well Let's go through the storyline here. The city also had a temple to Zeus and Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty and war, and Dionysius, the once dead god that was to rise from the dead, from the abyss. I'll explain this in a minute. So here Jesus saying, I'm the first and the last. You ain't. So he goes right back, tying this into a direct insult to the fallen entities, reminding them, putting them in their place here. People miss this about the book of Revelation because we don't want to teach it. We think it's just a myth and that these entities are somehow just no longer existing. And it's, and it's, just, and it's sad. But it had a temple to Zeus and Aphrodite. Aphrodite is Iana. It's, it's Ishtar. It's Azeroth. It's the same one. It's a finger puppet for seduction and the love goddess aspect of Ishtar. Or Artemis is the hunter aspect. Just think of them as finger puppets the same entity you and you can't go wrong <laughs> and so the idea here was you know to raise a dead god or a Dionysius a demigod out of the abyss and so that he can become a god and rule the world that was the idea I'm not going to go through all the aspects of this yet so keep tracking with me these were all compatible um, this type, this triple goddess worship, and with Aphrodite and Kybele and Dionysius and Zeus, was very compatible to, to emperor worship. So Smyrna was a place also of emperor worship, was big on emperor worship, worshiping the emperors of Rome, okay, the worshipers of the state, so that Aphrodite, aka Artemis, could bring Dionysius back to life as the world's 
Messiah, Zeus's son. Okay, that was the idea here. See, the emperor thought themselves as gods incarnate because they get help from the gods, from Aphrodite, Artemis, to bring Dionysius back to life, who would probably be them or their offspring or of the royal bloodline. And they were, that's what they thought themselves to be. Uh, gods incarnate. Maybe they were the ones destined to rule the entire world and bring this uh, new golden age of utopia there. That was the idea. This template about a dead and rising god, Dionysi, a.k.a. Adonis, or Demimus, or Tammuz, depending on whatever culture or society or, or country is, is teaching. It's the same entity as the finger puppets. Um, is seen in the history of the island Patmos concerning its patron gods in a symbolic manner. Remember, I, I'm going to repeat this again. The island of Patmos was first named Litros in honor of the goddess Artemis, who was also called Litoda because she was the daughter of Lito. Legend says that the island sunk into the sea and that Artemis, with the help of Apollo, managed to persuade Zeus to bring the island back to the surface. Symbolic of bringing another rock, another island, another person back up to rule the world. There's more to the story than, than I can get into right now, but that's the general theme. This parallels Iana's or Ishtar's descent into the underworld to retrieve her lover Demimus or Tammuz, which, well, it did not bode well, uh, end well, I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you the story, but that is pretty much the parallel theme here. Keep tracking with me. This template mirrors the pagan royal bloodline theory that's summed up in this, that the elites and the royalty in the ancient pagan world would birth forth a demigod who will become a god who would rule the world and bring in a new golden dawn of utopia. This has been going on for some time. That was their plan. And they wanted to defeat the god of the universe, the god of Israel. That's just, uh, there's a lot there that I just can't get into right now. But that's the general theme. These false gods, these fallen watchers, therefore, would do what they must to prepare the way and ensure that this would happen at some point of history. So these emperors would do, would invoke the names of these goddess or their false god, these fallen watchers, in order to make sure that their progeny would come forth to become that entity to rule the world, or maybe themselves were that, and when they find out that they're not, maybe their sons and daughters would be. They always thought that would be our one of the elites of the elite class of royal bloodline would bring forth this um, world ruler. So emperor worship used the power of the state along with its elites to impose their idea of a a well-balanced, perfect utopian world with them on top of the food chain, imposing retribution with the help of Kybele on those who oppose them. And in this case, it was the church. The church was battling this emperor worship, was battling Kybele and Zeus and Artemis worship in Smyrna. So, there, so this would mean they would invoke retribution from these spiritual entities. Okay, with that... We got to go back to the storyline of the dead rising God to, to understand what's going on here. The dead God did not is not dead. We find out through the Mesopotamian pantheon that they're imprisoned, very much alive in the abyss. And the idea was to provide a human agent in order for this one to rise out of the abyss and inhabit. So they become the emperor of the world. That's the idea. And this would come through, like I said, the, 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 the bloodline of royalty or the bloodline of the elites who supported the, the, the royalty. Any who opposed would be warred against and fought against, which was the church in Smyrna. Uh, that, thus the patron god would be going to war with God's people. So yet Kybele, the triple goddess, the old crone, the mother of the warrior daughter role, is to bury the church so their Messiah can rise from the abyss and rule the world. Revelation chapter 2.9. With that, just keep in mind what I just said. Remember, they're warring against the church in Smyrna. This is called the persecuted church. I hope you understand the reason why the church is being persecuted. Uh, because the church is to directly oppose a new world order. It is, is called to resist the evil one. I mean, it is called to be the lights of the world. And when you're that way, 
there is a spiritual war going on against principalities and powers. And listen to what the Lord says here in uh, verse 9 of chapter 2 of Revelations. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews or believers. That's just think of praisers of God. That's what the word Jews mean. Okay. Believers. Hypocrite believers. And, okay. That's what it's talking about here. Those who say they are believers and are not. These are the hypocrite believers, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Folks, not everybody in the church who's preaching out there is of the Lord. Okay. I'm just saying. There are a lot of hypocrites out there who say they are Christians, but they're hypocrites. I think some of you get the idea pretty well on there. So the church at Smyrna, myrrh, speaking of resurrection of the dead, that's the template that defines the definition of myrrh as in resurrection. Um, myrrh, remember, myrrh is the element that was, or, the, or was the stuff that they used to cover the stench of death and burial as well as for joy and celebration, too, referring to the resurrection of the dead. Okay, So the church at Smyr Smyrna has a double-edged sword meaning. The ancient pagan gods were seeking to resurrect an emperor to rule the world. But the Lord, in the very first verse, is reminding, no, I, this is already accomplished. He's the first and the last. God Almighty already did this. You ain't it. <laughs> And so, so we see the great joy of the resurrection of Christ defeating the entities. That's why it says in Colossians chapter is it two fifteen, I'm thinking that's it, where Jesus made a public spectacle of them on the cross. Hope you kind of get an idea of the power of those words, especially if you can use those and and implement those during spiritual warfare. So here we see happening in, in the church of Smyrna is a betrayal of believers by the false believers who sell out who sell out the people of God and trying to get everybody to go into emperor worship. That was the idea. That's what's the idea of those, what it says. What, what did I read here? Let me bring that up. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews or believers and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. What Jesus is saying, he sees the betrayal of believers. He sees this happening. This is a hallmark that you will see at the time of the end as part of the great apostasy that the, these people are trying to sell out and bring that emperor worship or that type of thing into the church to be accepted. And so Jesus spoke of this in Luke chapter 21. Uh, I think 12 through 19, I think. So I'm going to quote here. But before, the, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to, to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you as an occasion or a testimony. Therefore settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I'll give you a mouth... And wisdom which your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist and you'll be listen to this part and you will be betrayed by parents and brothers relatives and friends and they'll put some of you to death and you'll be hated by all for my name's sake but not a hair of your head will be lost by patience possess your soul so what we see in the world today being unleashed in many quarters of the church is a new fury of persecution that's happening worldwide. People say all the time, we don't see persecution in the church. Well, you know, they're burning down churches. They tried, you know, just recently. And uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter hates the church. They want to destroy the church. Um, we're seeing persecution of believers being silenced on the Internet. And uh, so don't tell me we're not in the beginning stages of here of it. So worldwide persecution is going to come. And because of the apostasy of people wanting to be politically correct, politically and agree with the state and emperor worship, they're creeping in there and they will turn you in in a heartbeat today. And it's been proven statistically that Christians are among the top persecuted groups worldwide right now. And guess what? Marxist progressivism and the left of the Democratic Party want to bury the church if it, if it does not conform to their will 
and their ways. That is the hallmark to look for in the coming days if we are reaching that state where Jesus is going to send forth the messengers to that group of people, the Smyrna, to strengthen them. This message is found all throughout the Bible in many forms. Okay, God sends people, prophets in to warn of this happening and to strengthen the remnant. Think of this as strengthening the remnant here. And verse 10 expresses that. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. So Smyrna would hear the word of Jesus spoken in Luke chapter 21 verse 17. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. By patience, possess your soul. They would understand that. They would grab a hold of that message because they understand what they're battling because they're approaching the days of apostasy when brother hates brother and all this stuff is going down where everything has become political. Look for that. That's what this is saying. Smyrna was one of two churches out of the seven had no call to repent. They were only called to overcome. Verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Meaning, the, the days of martyrdom will, not, will be fulfilled at a particular point in history, probably at the ushering in of the, of the millennium or, the, or at the white throne judgment. I don't know right off the bat. It's debatable. I'm not going to go into that direction and explore those aspects now. I'll leave that open to debate. But it says here, He has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So the church of Smyrna have a great resurrection, but they were called to suffer persecution. Why? Let's answer that. When persecution comes, the works of the devil are fully exposed. Think of Jesus what he went through on his way to the cross. Judas betrayed Jesus. Okay? He betrayed all the disciples, could possibly have got them all killed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Every, all the disciples fled Jesus, took off running. And then Jesus was taken to the magistrates and the leadership and the high priest and put on trial. False witnesses were bore, bore against him. He was meet, beaten and mocked and spat upon he was taken to Herod, and Herod wanted him to perform some thing for him. And then he went back, and, and he was beaten and mocked more. He was put in trial in front of the governing authorities, the state. And then he was sentenced to be put to death and crucified. Here's Jesus who do, did good and healed people and did fantastic, revealed who God is. And now Pontius Pilate had to consent and made a deal behind the scenes to get rid of the troublemaker, even though he was innocent, so he can control the population, sort of like what's going on in Smyrna in the, with the emperor worship. And so here you have uh, Jesus taken to be crucified, a heavy uh, thing put on his back called a cross. He could not bear. He dropped it. They got it, somebody else to carry it. They crucified Jesus. He divided his garments, they spat, mocked, ridiculed, blaspheming him. you got to ask yourself, who have you betrayed? Who have you abandoned? Who have you put on burdens that people could not bear? Who, who have you uh, lied about and cheated against and stole from? How many times have you made someone perform how, or even God tried to perform for you unless you, you know, think about what you've done to your friend, your family, yourself, and God. Okay, so when the enemy comes against you, people will begin to see that's how, they're not very good people. They're not very loving. They hate you. So therefore, their ideas of love and compassion are a joke. And sometimes the Lord will, if we love the Lord, and love our fellow beings, we'll follow the Lord's footsteps and even allow ourselves to die in order to expose evil in the hearts of people so that those witnessing the travesty what was going on will repent and get saved. And that was what was happening in the church at Smyrna. They were getting saved. 
because they saw the persecution. These people are good. What do they ever do? Jesus is good. He did good, good things. God's a good God. Why, why are you tormenting these people? Why do you want to burn down their churches? Why do you want to, uh, why, why do you want to destroy the nuclear family? You know, what's the deal here? Why do you want everybody to fall in line with the emperor and the world's elites to make a, this utopic world? Why do you want to raise uh, and worship the Antichrist? Well, come on. So people will be getting saved during the tribulation. So with that, I'm going to stop until next week on the Christian Marauder. So I know that this is a pre-recorded live stream, so I won't be able to answer the uh, comments. So until next time, the Lord bless thee and keep thee and make his face shine upon you. Let the Lord help you and bless you and keep you strong in the faith. In Jesus' name. And we will continue next week on Christian Marauder exploring the Church of Pergamos, Thyatira, or Thyatira, Sardis, and on until we're done with chapters 2 and 3. You be blessed in Jesus' name.